all of you to Carnegie, and it is a special pleasure to welcome my uh, former boss, former Secretary of State John Kerry, to discuss his extraordinary new memoir, uh, Every Day is Extra. It's really great to have you here. Thank you, Bill. Um, it's great to be here. Recovering diplomats like me have a bad habit of droning on at the beginning of events like this, but I promise I'll be brief and just offer two or three really quick observations. First, I can't think of an American public servant uh, who's done more over the last half century to shape the evolution of our society or of America's role in the world than John Kerry. From his military service in Vietnam through the turbulence of our own society uh, during the Vietnam and Watergate years through five terms as a U.S. Senator from Massachusetts and his own candidacy for president to four consequential years as Secretary of State, John Kerry has embodied the very best of American public service. Second, as many in this audience who've served with him can attest, I can't think of a public servant uh, who ever worked harder or with greater drive and passion than John Kerry. He really has lived and worked as if every day was extra, never wasting a single day, never letting any stone go unturned, never letting any diplomatic opportunity go untested, always convinced that it's better to get caught trying than not to try at all. And third and finally, I cannot think of a public servant better place to help us understand how to navigate through this deeply uncertain moment in our nation's history, drawing on the lessons of an earlier deeply uncertain moment. As John Kerry's rich life and wonderful memoir remind us, it's going to take hard work and honesty from all of us to recover our balance and recapture our promise. So our plan this evening is very straightforward. I'll get the conversation started with two or three questions and then open it up to all of you. At the end of the discussion at about 6.30, I'd ask all of you to hold your seats while Secretary goes downstairs uh, to sign books. I urge you to buy as many as you can carry. Uh, it's not too late for Rosh Hashanah or back to school gifts. And it's certainly not too early for Christmas shopping. So thanks again for joining us. And please join me in a very warm welcome for John Kerry. So thanks so much again. Um, let me start with the title, Every Day is Extra. Um, How did you choose it, and how has that insight shaped your approach to public service over all these years? Well, Every Day is Extra is what Donald Trump thought when Mueller was appointed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just figured that out, actually. Uh, no, Every Day is Extra, there's a very short author's note, and I, and I struggled, actually, as all authors do. Uh, I thought two of the hardest things to think about were, was the forward and then the afterward. And, um, and my publisher well advised me, you know, don't tackle it till you've written the book, because then you can really have a sense of kind of what you were trying to say and what it is. But in the end, um, there is an afterward, and, and, I, and I, it's a meaningful one, I hope, and it's a short one, uh, which is kind of where we go from here and what we have to take out of this book. The title itself comes from uh, a saying that my crew in Vietnam and others who were not on the crew but who came home, as we began to think about opposing the war and what we needed to do to end it, um, we realized that, that uh, we were obviously the lucky ones. And while we came home, a lot of people didn't. So we had this saying that uh, every day is extra. You know, we're lucky. Uh, we're living extra days because I could have been killed on any given number of days. And that is both a gift and a mystery, as I write, but it's also uh, a huge obligation, frankly. And we sense that, that you need to live a life of purpose. Uh, and in the end, the lesson is that uh, every day is extra sort of reminds you that there are just much worse things than flunking a test or, you know, missing a plane or 
losing a debate or losing an election. And that in the end, the worst thing of all would be to be, uh, see a lot of problems around you and be indifferent to them. So that's the meaning of the title, folks. And you do not have to go to war. You don't have to be a Vietnam veteran. You don't have to be uh, a recovering diplomat and politician <laughs> to understand that uh, everybody can live by that saying and everybody should. I'm an optimist. Obama, President Obama used to constantly say, John, God, you, you know, you, where do you get this optimism? You're too optimistic. I say, no, Mr. President, you're too pessimistic. I'm, I'm, you know, this is, the truth is that I am an optimist. And um, I'll tell you before I close my comments why I'm an optimist, because we have to talk about some tough things before that. But then I'll tell you why I truly am an optimist. But that's what the title's about. Thank you all for being here. I'm looking around and seeing faces that used to shout at me, Kerry, you're wrong about this. You gotta, you know. Anyway, Those were I, just, see, I saw the people who are laughing when I said that. You know who you are. <laughs> and Those I were, know who you are, too. <laughs> Those were just the State Department staff meetings. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, but thank you for being here. It really means a lot. And I look forward to uh, chatting with you about this book. The, uh, one thing I'll say about the book very quickly, if I can, because I was thinking about this, because at first, when I heard Woodward's book was coming out, I said, oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> It's a, a technical publishing term. Yeah. So, this was really good planning. Um, but then after you know, thinking about it and after listening to, to it and reading a lot of the excerpts and what it's all about is, Woodward, and I'm not kidding you when I say this, Woodward's book is the normal Bob Woodward brilliant piece of reporting that collects the truth from everywhere despite the denials. And, uh, and he's just too smart a reporter at this stage of his life and also has a good publisher. And uh, you know the lawyers are not gonna let him do this, folks, if they can't back it up. And so the hundreds of hours of tapes and so forth, uh, you, you can, you, you know, who are you gonna believe, Bob Woodward or Donald Trump? It's an easy one. <laughs> so that said, um, he lays out the problem, but he doesn't. It if you just have the problem, you can be pretty depressed. I really believe that my book, which is not a policy tone, it is not your traditional, you know, it's not present at the creation, it's not Kissinger diplomacy, by, and, and not just because they wrote a great book and I can't do that, it's because I didn't, we didn't want it to be. I didn't want it to be, the publisher didn't want that. This is a journey. This is the stories of a journey, uh, of a lifetime, of a young American life started in the end of World War II uh, and carries through the 1950s and the changes. And you know, we even talk about the music and the changes and things that happened as uh, you know, Buddy Holly came and went and Elvis came and went and the Beatles came and it just was all part of this journey. And you can't think of it any other way. Uh, the cultural transformation, the summer of love out in California uh, when I was in my first year of Navy training and so forth, the Grateful Dead at the Fillmore West, the Rolling Stones, uh, I mean, how many people can say, there's a Forrest Gumpian atmosphere. There's, a, there's truly a Forrest Gump component to my life. And I'll tell you, I'm gonna digress. I'll tell you a quick story. Some of you may remember, uh, that I appeared for duty with a broken nose when I was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee just before I was about to take a trip to go to uh, the Middle East. So here's the deal. I, I, uh, it is Forrest Gumpian because I described my meeting President Kennedy and calling him Mr. Kennedy. I didn't know you say Mr. President. Um, and the conversation we had, I described the uh, uh, going sailing with him on Narragansett Bay uh, and I describe a meeting and introducing John Lennon at a big anti-war rally. And so it's already pretty Forrest Gumpish. And uh, having Richard Nixon personally going after me when I was in Washington and so on and so forth. But I was out in Ketchum, Idaho, where we go for uh, Christmas. And we have an annual pickup hockey game, uh, broom hockey, 
and it's from age four to age 74, whatever. It's a huge run of, uh, of different levels of skating. And uh, this fellow came out with his son and they were taking part in, the, in, the, in this affair. And I'm skating down, going after the ball. We play with a ball, not a puck. And this guy falls right in front of me. And I decide rather than crash into him, I'm gonna try and dive over him and slide on the ice. So I'm diving over him head first. And he starts to get up before my legs have cleared him. So it's a legs up, face down situation. You could hear the nose crack all across the ice. And, and I turn around, I come up, I know it's bleeding a little bit, I know it's broken. I said, God damn, my nose is broken. And I turn around and there is Tom Hanks who's broken my nose. <laughs> and I feel, so what, what the hell do you say? I say, well, life is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> You know, you never know who's going to break your nose. Or maybe better, stupid is as stupid does, you know. But bottom line is, I swear to God, he broke my nose. And, uh, um, and I went straight to the hospital, and I, I saw him again, I don't know, months later. And he said, I owe you one. I said, yeah, you do. <laughs> but I showed up. But the next, about three days later, I had to take off to go to the, to, to the Middle East for negotiating all that stuff. And I put these big sunglasses on to hide. I literally looked like a raccoon. Big black eyes for months. And uh, it was the first time the president chastised me for being you know, excessively athletically inclined. The second time was obviously when I broke my leg in, in, uh, outside of Geneva, uh, just before the Iran negotiations were over. But in the reading of this book, I think in that journey you will First of all, I think it's honest. Uh, I talk about a lot of things that are very personal uh, and, and try to give everybody a sense of who I really am. And then uh, it goes through these gargantuan shifts and periods in our lives and my successes and failures as I try to navigate those early years. And then ultimately, uh, coming to the Senate and working with a lot of you who are here to shed light on Oliver North and Iran Contra and uh, the BCCI and and shut the banks and make Washington work and do what it's supposed to do. Um, so ironically, uh, you know, most of my class, my class was Jay Rockefeller, Tom Harkin, Paul Simon. Uh, uh, Tom Harkin, Paul Simon, Jay Rockefeller, I leave out, Al Gore, myself, and then the one single Republican is the only member of our class who is still in Washington as a senator, Mitch McConnell. First uh, senator elected from his state since Reconstruction in the party. So that was the group of us, and, and they all decided to go run for president within about four years or eight years of being there. It wasn't for 18 years before I decided to run for a lot of different reasons. And uh, thanks to all of you, we came within one state, uh, micro close. Uh, but this book tries to draw the lessons, acknowledge the mistakes, and most importantly, this is really what's important about it. This is why it's the, it's the antidote to what Bob Woodward lays out. This book describes how we accept and fight many times unsuccessfully, more times successfully, to make our democracy work. And never have we needed to do that more than right now. We're in trouble. And I don't try to be a troublemonger or to be a, you know, somebody who tries to scare people, but I'm telling you folks, uh, and I write about this in the last chapter in the book, I mean, I, I wish I could find legal standing to bring a case against Donald Trump for the lives that will be lost and the property that will be damaged in the billions of dollars because of his decision on climate change. This is life and death. Our democracy matters that much. And what is happening in the sloppiness of the diplomacy that's going on with Kim Jong-un, the sloppiness of the of, of his reckless statements in Europe at a time where Europe is already weakened somewhat and matters to us more than ever since the end of World War II. I mean, these things matter enormously, and we got to fight for them. 
And we proved in the course of the, and, and I lay it out in this book, you know, when I came back from the war, it was not an easy thing to stand up. People forget that today. When I stood up against Richard Nixon, there was a huge division in the country. And it was not a pathway to running for office or being involved in public life. It was a pathway to, you know, and I was arrested for civil disobedience and demonstrating against the war. So it was divisive, and I certainly earned some enemies for a lifetime through that experience. And we saw some of them come to the forefront in 04. That's what that was about. It wasn't about my record. It was about them being angry that I opposed the war and told the truth. And Ken Burns' movie has now helped reinforce that truth. But the point I'm making to you is that when Nixon was unleashing the FBI on people, when Nixon was engaged in prosecuting an enemies list, when Nixon was involved in cheating and lying and perverting the, you know, subverting the Constitution, and when, when he was in the midst of attacking the Justice Department and firing the Attorney General, the, the, the uh, special prosecutor, and then you know, the acting Attorney General resigns, Elliot Richardson. I mean, this was a process of dissembling of the American government, and people were thinking about it that way. We were in the midst of the Southern strategy, the exploitation of, of uh, people by virtue of race in full force. And all you have to do is listen to the Nixon tapes to hear uh, the bigotry and the hate that came out, despicable. And then, of course, there were pipe bombs blowing up in buildings and people carrying guns and shooting people in the streets. Uh, and Detroit was lit on fire with riots and Los Angeles and so forth. People forget this. And, and people wondered about American institutions. Guess what? We not only made it through it, we got stronger. And the nation came out of it brilliantly in the end. And we go through these crises. I think people forget how really strong the American people are. And we can get through this period, which is certainly the most dangerous moment for our country since all of that, and more dangerous in some ways, because Henry Kissinger and Nixon were not, you know, they were smart in foreign policy. I mean, let's be honest about it, with the exception. I mean, they tried to get out of the war, they took too long, they could have, in the end, they wound up basically bombing, as John Nagarpati said, and I quote him in the book, they had to bomb the North into accepting the concessions that we had made to the North Vietnamese. You know, it was a fundamentally a kind of surreptitious surrender in ways to get out of there. He knew we had to do that, thinking there'd be a longer, decent interval than there was. But the bottom line is, I think this book explains how we make it all work. And I'll just end on this note to you. 54.2. Remember that figure. Sear it in your brain, at least for the next two months. 54.2 is the percentage of American eligible voters who came out and voted in the last election. When I ran in 04, it was 60.4% turnout eligible voters. When Obama was elected in 08, it was 62.3%. When he was reelected, it was 58.5%. The message of that is, when was the last time it was 54.2? Al Gore. You gotta come out and vote. You've got to. And we've got to make sure millennials, kids, all the folks, you know, term. You know, when Trump won, 9% of the vote, of Obama's vote, actually went to Trump. 7% of Obama's vote didn't turn out. That's the difference in the race. So it's not the people who came out to vote for Donald Trump who are the story of this campaign and where we are today. It's the story of the people who didn't come out. And that's the lesson of this book. You have to work to make democracy work. You have to stand up to the big money. You have to call even a President Reagan out on BCCI or on Contras or whatever. You know, it matters that people believe in rule of law and stand up and fight for it. That's a much longer sort of response to your intro, Bill, but I think it's the heart. It's the heart of this book, folks. And it's the heart of what really is the solution to the problem we face today. There isn't a problem we face on this planet that we can't cure, human beings. But you need the leadership to put the choices in front of people. And right now, I don't see those choices being put to people. I just see division and, and, and uh, you know, sort of an arrogance and a dissembling 
and obviously a level of lying that is utterly stunning, in fact, just plain pathological. And that's part of the danger. So another, another part of the solution that you write about vividly in the book is your early years in the Senate and the capacity of your, you and your colleagues to work across partisan lines. And certainly we were all reminded of that at you know, John McCain's memorial service at the National Cathedral. You and he worked together to normalize relations with Vietnam to help heal the wounds in both of our countries. How, how do we recapture that spirit? Um, somebody asked me today, I think it was Judy Woodruff in an interview, um, how, how, who's, gonna, who's gonna bring those people back or something? And I said, uh, God and the American people. It was the only two people who can do this, or people, it's the only power and the only entity that can do this. I can't do it alone, you can't do it. But, but voting, doing what I just talked about. If we have the course correction that we can get this year, folks, uh, we get people in there who are gonna do the regular order like John McCain asked for and what we ought to be engaged in. There's no other way. I, 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 I said to people the other night somewhere, the, the, the rules of the Senate aren't exceedingly different from the way they were 50 years and 80 years ago. Yeah, something's changed on the voting of judges and there's been a you know, legislative nuclear explosion. But other than that, the rules are the same. How you bring a bill to the floor, what you do, what your powers are as a senator, what the presiding officer has to do, and so on and so forth. The problem is nobody does that. There's no real legislating taking place, real legislating taking place. Now I can remember Robert Byrd had us there through Friday night and Saturday morning and we were voting in real legislative succession and nobody knew what amendment was gonna come up and you'd bring it up and there'd be a real amendment and you'd debate it and you fought it. And ultimately there was the give and take of legislating where you get that sausage made even though it's ugly to watch it being done, it comes out okay and it lasts. That's how it's done, many of you were part of those battles in. I remember being at Ted Kennedy's house some night, and you'd have John Warner there, and Mac Mathias, and, and uh, Orrin Hatch, and, and a few Democrats, and we'd sit around, and we'd laugh, and we'd have fun, and there'd be jokes, but we would also talk about healthcare, or talk about uh, some country, or a war, whatever it was. And out of that discussion, the next day could come an amendment that would pass or an agreement, we're gonna try and end this nonsense, or whatever it was. You can't do that now. You're almost punished for the notion that you walk across the aisle to work with somebody else. You're part of the enemy. That's gotta stop, folks. And how does it stop? We need leaders who make it stop. You need, I mean, I believe that if Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer got together and they all agreed some night, look, this is crazy, we're destroying this institution. What are the 10 things we need to do in order to have regular order and start to move? Let's all agree we're gonna do it. We're not gonna have this game. You go back to your caucuses and you tell them, folks, we're not gonna to tolerate this anymore. You wanna be chairman of a committee? This is how it is. You make it work. It's called leadership. And right now we're just floundering around with this completely divided America. Why? Because we went through a period, and by the way, I'm gonna be an equal opportunity dispenser of, uh, blame for this. Uh, it's not one party that's to blame for it. Both have had their share of being excessive uh, in response to something that happened previously. Now I can't tell you whether something that happened previously was just uh, John Tower's rejection uh, or whether it was Robert Bork's rejection. Uh, but over the 1990s, certainly in the, in the heat of the Gingrich revolution, uh, something changed in the Senate. And you began to see this uh, all or nothing, this kind of vituperativeness take hold. And we saw a different kind of senator come over from the House. Those of you who were there know that's true. And, and the dynamic just shifted. And then, uh, because a lot of promises were made that were never kept, both sides, but the principal ones of the last few years have been this conservative movement that has been towards, you know, constantly saying, we're gonna end Roe v. Wade, we're gonna have lower taxes, we're gonna get rid of regulation, 
We're going to have smaller government, and those were the promises of the mid-1990s. Go read the, the contract with America. Okay, so there was excess, particularly in the impeachment process, take note. And, you know, people got bitten in the rear end, the House and Senate changed. But the Gingrich Revolution didn't deliver any of those things. And then you had the Tea Party. And you had a reiteration with greater adamancy of the same kind of promises. Now, get rid of government, get government out of your hair, liberate you, smell, run the list. Then you had Freedom Caucus, because they didn't deliver. And then guess what happened? You had a hostile takeover of the Republican Party by Donald Trump. You also had a fight going over on our side of the fence between Hillary and Bernie, and between the left sort of direction versus you know, how you get elected in America in terms of the you know, center and the needs to be rational about how you create jobs and what you do, and you have to pay for a few things here and there. Those are minor things in governance, but they matter. But the bottom line is that uh, we got a lot of pissed off citizens. And you cannot pretend to be involved in the public life of this country if you don't understand why people are pissed off. And they're pissed off because none of the promises have been delivered on either side of the fence. And, and, and particularly when you add to that the changes globally in the way we live. You know, we're, we're witnessing industrial revolution size changes, both culturally and physically in the workplace and economically, but it's happening at digital pace. And when you add to that the global transformation, it's no longer a world where the United States could make a decision about the economy or about whatever and make a mistake, but still win. No longer. It's far more, after the end of World War II, when we set up all these international institutions, which greatly favored our value system, obviously, and which Putin and Xi now pushing back against very hard, they're trying to create a new narrative for this century. And we're not being sensitive and thoughtful enough about how important that narrative is to actually getting things done on the planet and to sustaining it. So we have to really get back to work in order to restore our primacy of leadership around those values. And obviously this guy is going in exactly the opposite direction with great dangers to the interests of our country. That's the bottom line. But people have not done better. Politics is all about making people's lives better. I mean, Tip O'Neill used to always say to us, all politics is local, right? But it's not just local, I learned. All politics is local and personal. And it's also about perceptions. I had a professor in college who taught me that all politics is about felt needs. And we have not responded either side. Washington has not responded. Congress has not responded to provide for the felt needs of the citizens of our country. And it's, it, it, they're real needs too, by the way, but all you have to do is feel them and they're real. But when you look at what's happened to wages, First uptick in wages is in the last round here, but I don't know if it's sustainable because of what's happening with the trade war stuff. It's probably going to start to shred. Uh, and I'm glad President Obama went out and talked about the reality of when it began and how it happened. But my friends, here's the deal. Uh, people at the end of 2008, when the economic crisis hit, which we Democrats walked the plank on, we lost the House over it. A lot of friends lost their seats in the House because they dared to vote what we had to do. The Republicans, whose party it was that brought the travesty, ran away from it. And only Arlen Specter and a few others stood up, and Arlen Specter lost his seat too over that courageous vote. That's the cowardice of what has happened in American politics today. And right now, today, while every one of those guys up there on the Hill, they absolutely know how sick this situation is, how unbalanced and unhinged it is, how dangerous it is, but they are happier to ignore their oath of, of, of office to uphold the Constitution and save the institutions of America. They're happier protecting their power, their party, and their president, and that's a disgrace. So that's where we find ourselves, and it's all happened for extremely understandable, explainable reasons, 
And just as it's explainable and understandable, the antidote to it is, is, is there in the waiting. Now we got, what, how many seats? About, well, we need 23, obviously, to win, but I think there are, I forget the number, I think anywhere between 45 to 60 competitive seats. And God knows what, what's going to happen if everybody does their job and goes out and works. We've got so much more to talk about this evening, and I don't want to monopolize the question. So let me open it up to all of you. If you'd raise your hand, wait for the microphone. Uh, hello, Mr. Secretary. My name is Max Bone, and I'm a student of International Affairs at the George Washington University. For um, your entire term as Secretary of State, you were very involved in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, especially the past two years trying to get Kabila to have an election and not run for another term. Now, after it being delayed multiple times, many people being worried that he was going to run for another term, he has announced that he's not. However, many are worried about his successor, if he'll be any better and also about the legitimacy of the election. So I'm curious in your view if it is a victory for the international community that he has decided not to run and if we should step back or if we should, could, or if we should continue to put pressure and also if the Trump administration, especially with, ambassadors, with Ambassador Haley's advocacy, has done a sufficient job. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I'm delighted that President Kabila has made the decision he's made and I argued to him as strongly as I could, that he's a young enough man that he can uh, honor the constitution of the country and help the country to become much stronger. That some friend of his, I mean, you know, I mean, I, Putin is one example with Medvedev, but it's probably not the best example in the world. Um, but you can create a structure where somebody else is coming in for a period of time and you can go on if that's what you want to do. But I told him I thought that he could play a tremendous role as an ex-president who had kept the Constitution process intact and stood up for his country by leading private sector efforts to develop his country and to begin to attract investment around the fact that they're building stability in the country. And he could be a terrific ambassador for that. There are all kinds of ways to help. You don't have to just be the president. Um, I think that he uh, hopefully will do that, but I don't think by any means we should step back. I think the, the power of the United States, and I use as the example uh, what we did in, uh, in Nigeria with Buhari. Uh, I went there twice during the course of that process, read them the riot act the first time I went with a major uh, warning about what would happen if they either of them advocated violence or played games with the process. And Buhari uh, afterwards literally credited us, the United States, with our, with our advocacy for having allowed Nigeria to have an election that was fair, in which the, other, the, the incumbent president, whom he defeated, actually folded and, and went away and conceded. Not unlike what we accomplished with, with Musharraf in, in uh, Pakistan the same way. So our engagement, our leadership traditionally at the UN, within the international community, within the African Union and other places where we had credibility and impact makes a dramatic difference. Obviously the problem here is there's just not a lot of credibility to the efforts of this administration. I'm not sure it's on their radar screen or they're able to. I'd love it if Nikki Haley would tackle that. and She could have some impact because she's had some visibility and, and, and uh, I think she could help leverage attention on it. So I would urge her to try to do that. Thank you. Uh, I'm Faye Mokhtar, I'm a member of Atlantic Council. Uh, as an Iranian American who have lived in this country for 46 years, I was extremely delighted to see the Iran nuclear deal finally being signed. And thank you for your tireless <laughs> work. It was a perfect timing, perfect team from Iran. Uh, uh, now that the president, ha Trump, has gotten out of this deal with a signature, and do you really <coughs> believe that the Iranians will come to the table again and trust the United States 
to sign another deal with this administration? And the second question is, will you be running for the presidential office uh, 2020? <laughs> Well, let me, I'm not, let me answer the first question, if I can, for you just very quickly. Uh, not on your life or mine will they come to the table with this president. It's impossible politically, physically. Now, which, which underscores the fact that I think the administration is not uh, looking for uh, you know, a renegotiation. What they're looking for is regime change. And, and the, you know, once again, first of all, the United States of America does not do regime change well. I would have hoped people might have learned that by now. Uh, last evidence of that is, is uh, Libya uh, and our efforts uh, elsewhere in the Middle East. Um, but it displays a remarkable level of ignorance of, of uh, the region and the dynamics and the, and, and the reality on the ground in Iran, let alone the reality in our European allies and in the Russians and Chinese. It also uh, ignores a massive reality about uh, the politics of Iran itself, which is tragic because Anyone who has studied Iran or who has a sense of the country understands that the revolution of 79 uh, has had its opponents and detractors within, good morning, uh, has had its detractors within uh, the country. It's not a monolith at all. And all you have to do is see the green movement and the elections unfolding and the demonstrations to understand that. It is authoritarian and it can be pretty brutal and tough. And that means that people take great risks when they, when they try to step out. But Rouhani clearly was clearly in the more moderate wing of Iran, and it's all relative, but of Iran, and was trying to move people in a, in a different direction. And the hardliners, the IRGC and others, even the Ayatollah said to him, don't negotiate with the great Satan. You can't trust them. It was a huge leap of faith for them to get to the place where they agreed to negotiate. And they agreed to negotiate largely based on their sense that both President Obama and I were on the up and up and Bill Burns that they respect and Wendy Sherman and the people they were dealing with were on the up and up. And they could trust us and they learned very quickly we negotiated in good faith. Uh, we got around to do, uh, frankly, uh, really amazing things, unheard of things, in terms of the turnaround on their program. And um, I regret to say that uh, because of what Donald Trump has done, it's impossible politically for anybody to turn around and just capitulate and cave in and come back to the United States and now negotiate because we were pressured into because we got out of the thing. No way. The best you can hope for is that an administration can come in with credibility and people with credibility can re-engage with them and try to bring them back in some form. And that itself will involve a new negotiation because they will want to negotiate the secondary sanctions and the banking situation, which they never benefited from, frankly. Uh, and we will want to negotiate Yemen, Hezbollah, other things now because the dynamic has changed. So I think there's a different thing that would unfold. But um, here's the danger, everybody. Countries in the region were telling me, I probably Bill, I'm sure Bill, I know Bill, and the president and Hillary, that the only way you guys can deal with Iran is you got to bomb them. I heard those words out of the mouth of President Mubarak. I heard them from King Abdullah. Uh, I mean, there were, and I heard them from Bibi Netanyahu, all of whom said, you got to bomb them. And a couple of them were actually importuning the White House during that time to give them a green light to go do it. And President Obama did not. He resisted that. So, you know, I mean, before you've even done diplomacy, they were saying, you got to go bomb them. And we at least argued, at least you've got to exhaust the remedies of diplomacy to earn the credibility so that if you have to go to the UN, you've got people with you and so forth. But um, 
so I have no doubt that by virtue of the, the pursuit of this agreement, we avoided a war in the region. We avoided conflict. And nothing, I'm telling you, would be as, as ugly as a prolonged asymmetrical war with Iran. And it will be asymmetrical. They know we can drop a bunch of bombs on them and ruin their, their buildings and knock them down, et cetera. But how many of you have forgotten Kobar Towers? And a whole bunch of them might be following after that, not to mention problems in the subways of Paris and London and whatever, where whoever joined in that effort. If we were alone, it'll be us alone. And that will not be pretty. Now, that said, um, the dangers of this are that, I mean, look, if you're the best negotiator in the world, which someone claims to be, <laughs> um, it seems to me the much smarter approach to this would have been threaten to do what, you, what he did, but use it to get the Europeans and the Chinese and the Russians all to agree that rather than do that, we're going to go put a lot of pressure on them about Yemen, about Hezbollah, about transfer of weapons. And you say to them, okay, I'm going to stay in it for the next two years. I mean, it's a 15-year period before anything changes. They physically cannot make a bomb for 15 years. You know that. And then they can only do it if, if they want us to know what they're doing, because we will know whatever they're doing. If they started to use higher enrichment to go do something, we'll know it. But it, under these circumstances, I'm telling you that uh, what the president should have done is said to them, and then you'd have had the UN with you. You'd have had everybody agreed on the strategy. And you stay in, keep them from having any right to go do anything with enrichment or make a weapon, but put the pressure on them for what's happening in Yemen, what's happening in these other places, which is a legitimate concern. By the way, we were always concerned about those things. We never, we kept the sanctions in place on weapons and we raised them. We kept the sanctions in place on the transfer of weapons to Yemen and we raised those sanctions. We kept the sanctions in place on human rights. And we kept the sanctions in place in what they were doing fooling around with Hezbollah. And Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. So we were never soft on any of that. We just had, I think, a reasonable, realistic strategy about how you actually get from here to there. And, and I think it's laid out in the, in the book pretty clearly. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Hany Nasser with the Embassy of Canada. Um, as you know, uh, this administration has taken certain economic actions against close allies and partners. Uh, I wanted to get your views on administration's goal of advancing priorities without these partners as they take certain actions, but also what role does Congress, the Senate have, in, um, especially in, in trade negotiations? Thank you. Well, Congress is obviously supposed to, uh, well, Congress has the final say on the trade negotiation <clears throat> because Congress has to pass whatever it is. Whether they review it early or review it late depends on the structure of the agreement, but uh, Congress has a very significant role in terms of trade. Uh, I think that, uh, but don't expect this Congress right now to step in and save everybody from anybody. Uh, they seem excessively intimidated uh, by the president, um, because the great fear that people have today is not general elections, it's primaries. And the result has been you've had a shift. Because of the, I mean, there are two great evils in the American political system today that are tearing us apart. One is the amount of money in American politics, and the second is the gerrymandering of the United States Congress which prevents people from having a genuinely democratic general election. So what's happened now in this transformation is in the House and Senate, they terrorize members with the threat of a primary with all the Trumpistas now, but even before Trump, he didn't start that. Uh, you had the, uh, you know, you had the, one of the caucuses would motivate, I mean, Ted Cruz was out there screaming to people about, you know, we're gonna primary you. And, who was it? David, uh, what's his name from uh, Louisiana? Not Vitter. Yeah, I guess it was Vitter. 
uh, he, he uh, you know, they used, to, they used to raise PAC money against their own colleagues in the caucus. And, and, and so people just want to avoid all that, except for Bob Corker and Jeff Flake, who've decided to go elsewhere because of it. Um, <clears throat> and now Ben Sass, who's speaking out a little bit. So uh, I don't see much happening, unfortunately, and I'm afraid Canada, I mean, I cannot believe we're at war with Canada economically. It's just stunning to me how, how, how lined up we are with Canada, how we share so much, how important the relationship is, and likewise Mexico. I mean, I spent time creating a North America caucus. We wanted Canada, Mexico, and the United States to be closer and join more and acting more as a block, even in the context of trade as we could have transitioned into a new era of our trade relationships. But now he's blown that too. If you're the world's greatest negotiator, can you negotiate better with Canada and Mexico as part of the entity, and then go out to the world and say, here's how we think it's gotta be in order to deal with North America? That is far more powerful than, than dissing everybody, and you could substitute a P for the D and say on. And you, it's just astonishing to me what, what, what they're doing, and the price is gonna get paid, folks. Uh, China's lining up the next round of countervailing tariffs, and uh, we will lose jobs. It will be higher cost to the American consumer, and there's a break point here where you don't get this on the slow. It starts to speed up. That's just the way it works. It does take a special kind of diplomacy to alienate the Canadians. Um, <laughs> yes, ma'am. So since the 2000 elect 2016 election, cybersecurity and information warfare is an issue which has come into the American consciousness uh, that has largely gone ignored by the current administration as a political status quo. Hypothetically, how would you provide, uh, especially using the resources of the Department of State, both accountability for governments which commit foreign attacks and also begin to establish an actual deterrent against cyber warfare? Well, I'll tell you uh, what, I, what I would, there are a couple of things that a president should do right now. Uh, one is on climate change, and we can come back to that one afterwards, but on this subject, um, I, I worked very hard. I came to uh, the Senate in 1984 election when Reagan won Massachusetts, and um, you know, Massachusetts gets, a, this is a digression, but gets a bad name. Uh, everybody says, oh, it's so totally blue and it's a hardcore, uh, you know, far left Democratic state, et cetera. It's really not, folks. We've had in the last, of our governors, of our last seven, uh, seven of our last eight or nine governors, I guess we had Deval Patrick and one other, that's it. They've all been Republican in Massachusetts. We were the second state in the nation have a property tax rebellion called Prop Two and a Half after Prop 13 in California. And Ronald Reagan carried Massachusetts twice by record levels. And the only reason we got stuck with the McGovern sort of sense, oh, this state voted for McGovern, it was the narrowest margin any Democrat had ever carried Massachusetts by uh, against Reagan. It just happened to fall in a column. It could have gone the other way and been 50 states. So that, and then Ted Kennedy obviously sort of reinforced it, but there's this sense that that's where I supported when I first came into the Senate, the Graham Rudman Hollings effort, because I thought we needed to balance the budget. I thought we were in trouble economically. And indeed, in the 1990s, we balanced the budget. And Massachusetts supported that. Ultimately, Teddy supported that. So we're not this you know, place over there where we can be impervious to the normal currents. And we, and by the way, we had Louise Day Hicks, and we had major opposition to school busing, and, and the racial issue has torn our state as it has a lot of other states. So I say all of that as a, 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 a just to kind of underscore to you that uh, uh, you, you know you can't just sort of be automatic about what's going to happen in in the state as a result. 
Now, your, where are you there? Your, your, the center part of your question was the, not the... It's cyber security. Cyber, so let me come back. Yeah, I just wanted to finish that piece of it. So we need to, we have huge technology in Massachusetts. We have huge technology capacity in California, Texas, New York, other states. What we need to do, and what I was describing 84 about was because back then we had the nuclear freeze and we had a lot of focus on the MX missile and on arms control. And I was hugely motivated by arms control. And I'd been to nuclear chemical biological warfare school in the Navy and I you know, knew enough about the throw weights and the you know, radiation and clouds and so forth that it just was beyond comprehension to me that we had 50,000 warheads each aimed at each other. What did we do? We got together, the great powerful nations of the world, and we sat down and got rational about it for the first time and started in the opposite direction, and we had arms control agreements. My great goal in the Senate for years was to be a member of the Arms Control Observer Group with Sam Nunn and with John Warner and these guys, and it was where the action was. Today, I think far more realistically dangerous, far more of a threat to our country on a daily basis and to other countries is the potential of a cyber attack and cyber warfare. In a world where we all depend on technology, where computers are running our air traffic control system, our water treatment facilities, our nuclear plants, our, run the list, transportation, railroad gates that open and shut, you know, you run the list of these things, and it ought to be scary to everybody. We need to begin immediately a new era of arms control in cyber. And the United States ought to be leading Russia, China, France, some Middle Eastern countries. Uh, every country with this higher level cyber capacity ought to be at the table, and we have to come together and hammer out a global agreement about transparency, accountability, rules of the road, and remedies, enforcement. And uh, the same way we have on arms control, like an NPT, people have to sign up to it. And I'm gonna be pushing this out there as hard as I can because, you know, we actually sat in the, in the situation room in the White House with President Obama and discussed responses to Russia for the hacking. And I can't go into the details uh, of it except to say to you that, you know, because classified, but uh, we talked about some pretty scary, awful things that we could do. But part of the problem was we also knew they could probably do it. So now you're seeing a new age of this administration talking about going into space weapons. That's insanity. I fought that back when we were in the Senate. I led the fight to stop anti-satellite testing. And we won that fight. Folks, we won it. I thought we'd put it to bed. Now it rears, it's like Dracula. You get to put, you know, some sort of stake through it. I got a better idea where you put the stake. But we, we, you know, we got to do this. You have to have a cyber arms control regiment, and you've got to have a method by which you're going to agree on how you're all going to police it and enforce it. And if we keep going with the arms race we've got in cyber now, uh, we're going to all live in a much more dangerous world because without firing a shot, you could bring the financial system of a, of a country to a dead stop. And the recovery from that, I don't even know how you begin to. Trillions of dollars being monkeyed around with and changed. It's very, very tough, scary stuff. So that's where I think we have to go on cyber. Let's get somebody in the back here. Give them a shot. The backbenchers. Way in the way in the back on the right, as far back as we can go. This is I'm afraid this is gonna be the last question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Young Kim from Voice of America. Uh, so uh, how do you assess the latest development with North Korea and um what do you think about Trump administration criticizing Obama administration's strategic patience policy? Technically men do nothing. I'm oh, sorry, I couldn't hear the last part of it. So uh, very President Trump administration criticizing Obama administration's strategic patience policy. Technically, men are doing nothing on North Korea. On, on North Korea? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And the very beginning, you began, you said, what do you think of? The latest development with North Korea. The latest development with North Korea. What is the, I mean, do you consider, 
a statement by King Jong-un about how much they love each other, the latest development? <laughs> I don't consider that a development. Uh, he's got nuclear weapons, and our intelligence committee has told us that he's growing those weapons. That's the development we ought to be paying attention to. And the fact is that all this gooey back and forth, I think, is called North Korean rope-a-dope. Uh, I mean, think about it, folks. Uh, you go to have a, a, a summit with scant preparation, no communique pre-agreed upon, no understanding of how you're going to define nuclear denuclearization, no understanding of where you're going to go with respect to the accounting for whatever exists as weaponry, what is the declaration they're prepared to do, how will you reinforce, how will you document that declaration, and how will you then begin to deal with that declaration? There isn't one single detail that came out of this incredible summit because, frankly, President Trump just wanted the reality TV event of having a big summit with all the flags and a meeting, and they come out and say, God, he's a really good guy. I like him so much now, and he likes me. Well, anybody in this room who spent any period of time reading about Kim Jong-un would think twice before they run around saying those kinds of things based on a single meeting. Uh, just ask the people who literally threw up because they were forced uh, and fainted because they were forced to watch the public execution of people but with them using 122 millimeter anti-aircraft guns against human beings. Uh, it's ugly stuff. And uh, there is no sign whatsoever that what happened in Singapore was anything more than Kim Jong-un getting something that his father and his grandfather both wanted, both tried to get, and never got because the preceding presidents, Republican and Democrat alike, were unwilling to give them a meeting to legitimize them unless they had something positive moving forward on denuclearization, on the talks, on a structure. Uh, and we went through it once before in the 1990s when Clinton did come up with the agreed upon framework of the 1990s and they cheated. So, you know, what's the old saying? You know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Uh, I just think that this is a, a, a difficult. Now, would I, now, let me be fair. This is important. I'm an advocate of engagement. You all know that about me. I would have pushed to try to have a conversation. I think that's good. I'm glad he wanted to have a summit rather than engage in the back and forth tweeting and rhetoric that they had. I just wish that it had been implemented and worked on in a way that advanced the process so that you come out with something and you know what your roadmap is and where you're heading. That's, that's the problem here. It's not that you wanted to talk and I, I would have probably been an advocate for breaking the, uh, the gridlock of always requiring everything you needed, as long as you got enough to know you're really sustaining the process. Um, and I would have supported a temporary halt in the exercises in order to try to create the atmosphere within which you could try to do that. What I fear is that North Korea got more out of it in a way that uh, helps them. And now they're just going to, I mean, I'm told through the intel stuff that has been public. I'm not going into anything private. But the public intel stuff says they're still building. They're building more. They're moving them around. They're hiding them. And uh, that's dangerous. That's not a good situation. So that's where we are. Let me clo close, if I can, by honor. I want to honor Bill's admonition, the last question. And I know. Uh, we have another part of this, so. But let me try to share with you uh, a sense of this, of this optimism. And I believe in it, I believe in it partly because of what I saw when I was at the State Department over the four years I was privileged to be there. I believe in this optimism because I, there's so many good people in this country who want to tap into the best of who we are and of what we believe. And because I've seen what we can do when we put our energy into the effort to make our country what we believe it is and want it to be. 
I also am powerfully influenced by the realities of the world we're living in and around us, folks, measured against history. We are curing diseases today that we never imagined we'd cure. I mean, smallpox, tuberculosis, forms of cancer. We have, we have highly targeted, personalized cancer treatments now because of the Genome Project, et cetera. We're, we're living longer than we've ever lived before as human beings. We live a higher quality of life in the United States, in Europe, in certain parts of the world than any people ever dreamed they would live. We earn more money. We, we are able to move around freely, able to take part in the political process, et cetera. If you're a woman somewhere in the world today, you are 50% more likely to give birth, if you're pregnant, to give birth and live through it. You're 50% more likely that your child lives through it and will be fed and go to school. We are on the verge of having the first generation of children born AIDS-free in Africa. Why? Because we started PEPFAR, because we put money into the antiretroviral drugs and we've done the building of a healthcare structure. Ebola, I sat in that, in that situation room and we were told a million people are gonna die between now and, and Christmas in four months. And we refused to accept that idea. And President Obama committed 3,000 troops to go to West Africa. We worked with the French and the British. We stopped Ebola in its tracks with a fraction of those number of people dying. You look at what's happening globally in terms of violence. Yeah, it was horrible. It was the most sickening thing I ever saw in my life was the video of that Jordanian pilot being burned to death in, 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 a, in a cage. And, and, then, and the second, or equally as sickening, was uh, seeing uh, Foley uh, with his head cut off and so forth. So we see horrible acts of violence. They're despicable. And, and they scare everybody, which is what they're meant to do. But when you take the totality of what's happening, even with the bombs going off in certain places at certain times and, and the conflicts we have, far, far fewer people are dying today of violence in the world than at any time in human history, and particularly in the last century. 30 million Russians died, 6 million Jews. Run the list. And that was state-on-state -state violence. In this century, we're seeing a different kind of violence. We're seeing non-state actors, so the principal actors of, of discord and dissension. And, and except for Putin and Russia, it's rare that you are seeing a state act against another state or try to take territory. So, so the psyche has changed, psychology has changed, the reality has changed. Moreover, 450 million people have been brought out of poverty in China. New middle class, same, not quite the same number, about 400 million in India are, are, are now a new middle class. But it's true, South Korea, 15 years ago, we were giving aid to South Korea when I was in the Senate. Now South Korea is delivering aid to countries in the world. So I see a march of progress. Until this moment, I've also seen a march of democracy, a march of freedom, a march of, look at what Lech Walesa did, look at what Vaclav Havel did. And they were inspired by us. And that's what we have to get back to, folks. Remembering who we are and, and believing not in this tribalism and this, you know, this dirty populism that is being used by Trump et al. to scare people, but by leave, but believing in, in the power of people, but the power of people to do good things because we're putting good things on the table that we ought to be doing. And, and I, you know, severe poverty when I was in college was 50% of the world. Severe poverty today is less than 10% of the world. It's amazing what's happening. That's why I am hopeful. We go through crises. We go through terrible moments. The darkest of all must have been, you know, and, and I read a lot about it still, is World War II and the darkness of the world during that period of time. And we've made mistakes since then in Vietnam and in, in various other countries. But we've learned from them, I think. And I think the American people are prepared to be engaged with the world, engaged to try to make a difference but they want common sense and honesty in sharing with them what the plan is, how we're gonna make a difference, and what we're gonna do. And, and you know, de Tocqueville noticed when he came to America, 
in the 1800s and, and wrote his famous treaties. He, he said, you know, there's something different in America. The American people are different. And they're different because they do charity. They give to other people. They take care of other people. And lots of other countries, that doesn't happen. So I am convinced our value system is worth fighting for. And I believe deeply in what I used to talk about as a, as a secretary and as a senator, and which others, you know, you hear more people sort of uh, tapping into this now, that what separates us from everybody else on the planet is the fact that we do not define people by, by caste or by race or by religion or color of skin. They are not supposed to. Some people now are. But that's not America. America has the idea that all men and women are created equal. And that's the idea around which we've organized ourselves since we were founded as a country. We are an experiment, folks. Remember that. We are still an experiment. We don't know how this turns out. But I know what we were warned to think about by none less than Ben Franklin when he walked down the steps of Constitution Hall after they had worked late into the night and finally re resolved what the structure of our government would be and put it to paper. And a woman shouted at him, tell us, Dr. Franklin, what do we have? A monarchy or a republic? And he looked at her and he said, a republic, if you can keep it. That's, that's the mission, folks. And that's why I'm optimistic, because I not only think we can keep it, I think we have an obligation to try to make sure that other people get the same shot we get. Not a bad motivation. Mr. Secretary, thanks for ending on such a... Just on behalf of all, us, all of us, I want to thank you for ending on such a powerful and positive note. Thanks for a terrific book, and thanks for everything that you've done and continue to do for our country. Thanks, Bill, thank very you. much. Thank you all. See a few of you, I hope, afterwards.